Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, close to 5,000 Israelis have now been diagnosed with the coronavirus. Israel may have a new way of battling COVID-19, and it's wine o'clock somewhere, which is why we'll reveal the top Israeli wineries that you can order from directly to your house as you socially distance. Over 4,800 people have now been diagnosed with the coronavirus in the state of Israel, with 136 new cases discovered since last night alone. 83 are now in serious condition and over 95 are moderately ill, and the rest are exhibiting mild symptoms. And while 163 have recovered already from the disease, Israel saw two more deaths overnight because of COVID-19, bringing the total death toll up to 18. Now, one of last night's victims has been identified as the youngest Israeli yet to pass away from the coronavirus, 49-year-old Tamar Peretz Levy, who was survived by four-year-old twins. Her partner Shimon died of heart failure shortly after their birth, and most of Tamar's family is now quarantined. The second victim was also a female that was only 50 years old, and so far Jerusalem continues to remain the city with the highest amount of cases in Israel, followed by Bnei Brak and then Tel Aviv. In the meantime, the Israeli Mossad has just brought 8 million masks into the country and 27 new ventilators amidst fears that Israel does not have enough medical gear to properly address the coronavirus crisis. And the health ministry is now urging Israelis as well to use makeshift masks by wrapping materials around their faces instead of stocking up on surgical masks amidst the worldwide shortage. All right, now the Israeli government is now rolling out new restrictions as well in, or in efforts to stem the spread of the coronavirus as infection numbers continue to increase. The Israeli prime minister has announced the new rules from his official residence in Jerusalem, where he is also currently in self-quarantine after one of his closest aides was diagnosed with COVID-19. <laughs> למרות שהבדיקות הרפואיות בענייני עדיין לא הסתיימו, החלטתי להיכנס לבידוד מרצון כדי לתת דוגמה אישית. הצלם נמצא במרחק של שישה מטר, ואת האיפור והשיער עשיתי בעצמי, ולכן זה נראה ככה. אני ממשיך לעבוד מהבית. Israel's newest regulations now require businesses to only allow no more than 10 people or 15% of their workforce to work from the office or outside of home. Before coming into work, employees will be required to take their temperature and fill in a statement guaranteeing that they don't have any symptoms of coronavirus, like a fever of 38 degrees or more, a cough or shortness of breath. And in places of work where employees can't maintain a distance of two meters from one another, employers will be required to instate other measures to prevent infection. No gatherings will be allowed in public spaces anymore, including for prayers and weddings, and individuals who pray should do so alone. At the Western Wall, a single prayer group of 10 people will be allowed during three different daily services, but all people must maintain a distance of two meters from one another. Funerals will be held in open spaces only and can be attended by up to 20 people. And Blit Mila circumcision ceremonies are allowed to be held with up to 10. Shipping will continue to be allowed for all products. These latest regulations join the rules put into place last week, which prohibit Israelis from venturing more than 100 meters away from their homes unless it's to seek various essentials, like food or medical care. Now, a new method of predicting the coronavirus' spread, pioneered and developed by Weizmann Institute scientists, may soon enable authorities to focus efforts on areas where an outbreak is most anticipated and maybe even relieve measures taken in other areas. Joining us with the details is Chagai Rosman, PhD student at Weizmann Institute and part of CoronaIsrael.org initiative. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now, why, why are you doing this? What, what's, the, what's behind this uh, initiative? You know, it's voluntary. You don't know whether people are, are actually uh, sick or not. You're not getting money for this. So, so where, what's the driver? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for having me. So we at Weizmann Institute of Science, uh, together with the Sadna, we had a vision. We know that to fight this pandemic, we saw it in South Korea and other countries as well, we need as much information as we can get. This is the number one thing that we can do to, to fight this uh, virus. And testing alone, you know, the PCR test, it's not enough. We can maybe get to a few thousands, tens of thousands, and so on tests. This will not be enough. We will not get enough information about the whole population at a national scale. 
So over here at the Weizmann Institute with the Sadna and also working with the Ministry of Health, we thought of another way of something that can complement all the other efforts and could be on a national level. It was just a simple one-minute survey, which you could fill at coronaisrael.org, like you said. Every, every person, every citizen, once a day, every day, even if you're healthy, sick, whatever, we want you to fill this, fill out the symptoms that you're experiencing. We scan the literature and working with other researchers and doctors and Ministry of Health, and we know what symptoms are kind of associated with COVID-19. And we, we're trying to actually build these heat maps, these maps on the neighborhood level, city level, uh, whatever resolution uh, we could get on a geographical end time scale. We've done this mm -hmm. already for more than two weeks. Uh, we're, we're nearing more than 400,000 uh, times that people have responded. Wow. And as much data as we can get, we want to give policymakers and the population another tool, a strategic tool to fight this virus and to, and to find the spread before it actually spreads uh, even further. All right, now, you mentioned the health ministry uh, has partnered with you, but who else is, is participating? Are there individuals abroad who are also participating, and, and how does that maybe help your data? Yeah, so, so over here, this project is actually looking at Israel, of course, but we're actually collaborating with many researchers, more than 15 other countries that we are in direct contact. Some of these countries have even kind of uh, uh, took this effort and, uh, and recreated it in their own, like the UK, US, we have a few efforts, China, Italy, Spain, many European countries. So they are also doing this at their level. This is, of course, kind of an effort that is, is more local because we want to catch local spreads. But we are sharing methods, data, uh, whatever we can that, that can help each other to, to use this as a new tool to combat. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, your short questionnaire, I actually, earlier today, I, I went and I filled it out just to, if for nothing else, than to see what's in it. Now, you, you ask questions about sex, uh, age, general area of where you live, and of course, uh, certain questions about how people are feeling in their temperature, but is that enough to keep individuals informed? Because again, is that going to be enough to, to let somebody know that they're sick or not? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, the, the idea of this whole survey, we want to keep the people's privacy. We don't want to, you know, to have any privacy issues and so on. We're looking at kind of a more local level, at a neighborhood scale. That's like the smallest resolution we're actually looking at. We are not looking at the individual level. This will not be a tool that will tell you or uh, your family member, if he is sick. For that, you have to use the other tools. You have to go to their doctor. What we want is something at a neighborhood level to, mm -hmm. to kind of detect the spreads are actually at a local level, right? It's not just one person. This virus spreads in clusters, in local clusters. So that's the level we're looking at. We also, we always have the trade-off between the privacy. You know, we, we as researchers would, let, would like to get as much information as we can, but we understand that we cannot do this for security and privacy reasons. So we're focusing this tool on the local level. Yeah. All right. Well, Chagai, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please stay healthy, of course, and good luck in, in your own isolation and social distancing. Everybody at home, please go to coronaisrael.org uh, and take the survey. It can only help. All right, now, in related news, the greatest driver behind innovation has always been necessity, and needs related to the coronavirus pandemic are no different, like the suddenly desperate need for a way to sanitize large rooms uh, and areas in places like a hospital in as short a time as possible. Well, IAI, or Israel Aerospace Industries, may have the solution, and ILTV's Nittany Manson has the story. Israel's largest aerospace and defense company, IAI, is best known for making satellites, specialized aircrafts, and now the famous Bereshit lunar lander. But all attention at the company has now shifted towards addressing COVID-19. And IAI's first invention, which was developed in just about a week, is already being tested at the Shamir Medical Center outside of Tel Aviv. The prototype is for a standing lamp with specialized ultraviolet light emitters that kill viruses and bacteria, and this will make sterilizing hospital rooms and other such spaces dramatically easier. The only drawback to the device so far is that it's only effective within a reach of 2 meters and would need to be rotated and moved around a room several times before the room is totally sterile. Still, it's a much easier way than manually sterilizing everything with chemicals like chlorine and alcohol, which hospital staff has currently had to do. And if all goes well, the next model will also be robotic, capable of entering, sterilizing, and exiting rooms automatically. Now, meanwhile, IAI isn't the only Israeli company creating potentially life-saving tech. In fact, at least 70 different companies have developed some sort of response to the virus, including the government's Hamagen, or Shield app, which lets you know if you've come into contact with an infected person or location. Then finally, there's also apps by private companies like Vocalis Health, 
which hopes to develop ways to diagnose coronavirus patients using just the sound of their voice. Now, as the Israeli economy struggles in response to increased regulations, the Israeli finance minister has now announced that Israel will be spending tens of billions of shekels to stimulate growth. The aid package features funds from the health care system and helping out at-risk groups, a social security safety net for salaried employees, the self-employed freelancers, and the elderly, and a program for the acceleration of the economy. Ten billion shekels will go towards the health care system to fund the cost of ventilators, 20 million coronavirus tests, protective gear, and to stabilize hospital budgets. One billion will fund initiatives to assist the groups who are at most risk of contracting severe cases of the coronavirus. Three billion shekels will be used to fund unemployment benefits for those over the age of 67, and employees placed on unpaid leave will be assisted by a 14 billion shekel package. 200 million will go towards non-profit organizations. Now, self-employed workers whose income has been damaged by the current crisis will be eligible for two grants, a first payment of up to 6,000 shekels in April, and a second payment of up to 8,000 in May. Over 40 billion will be allocated to ensuring business continuity, which would include canceling municipal tax, social security payments, and utility bills. And then last but not least, almost 8 billion shekels would be aimed at bolstering economic growth by aiding the high-tech industry, accelerating construction projects, and improving digital services for Israelis. All right, now let's shift focus for a moment to our pending unity government. In light of the coronavirus pandemic, Israeli leaders between the center-left and the right-wing blocs have been negotiating a unity coalition now for the better part of a week. But already the wide spectrum of political ideologies trying to cooperate appears to be threatening the fledgling government. It's only been a few days since the Blue and White Party dissolved as Chairman Benny Gantz and several others set out to deal with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And in his first full Knesset session as Speaker on Monday, Gantz heard all the accusations of abandonment that you might expect from his former partners. But in spite of best intentions, unity talks between the Likud and the Blue and White parties still appear to be breaking down. Major arguments still linger over important policies like the West Bank annexations backed by the United States' peace deal. The main issues at heart, however, lie in ministry appointments. Blue and White still strongly opposes Yaakov Litzman's continued role as health minister, especially with the pandemic in mind. But Litzman refuses to accept any other position. Also, center-left MKs are looking to keep former Speaker Yuli Edelstein from returning to his role. But Edelstein, then, is demanding the foreign ministry, which has also been promised to blue and white. Meanwhile, the right-wing bloc is also unhappy. Gantz is demanding and will likely receive nearly a one-to-one -one ratio of MKs to ministry portfolios, while the right will be lucky to get one portfolio for every four MKs. So right-wing lawmakers are threatening now a mutiny starting with the religious Yamina party, which states that it would rather sit in the opposition than be sidelined in the new government. While in efforts to appease all parties, ministry portfolios have been greatly expanded to 36, the most of any Israeli government in history. But only time will tell if this will be enough to keep a coalition together. Moving on, Passover is just around the corner, and because of the coronavirus, certain religious regulations are being altered. So where are Jews allowed to pray and who can they celebrate with as the world socially distances? These are just some of the questions that the founder of the Tel Aviv International Synagogue, Rabbi Ariel Constantine, is going to answer with us today. Rabbi, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, now, first of all, we have seen a sky-high infection rate in ultra-Orthodox communities, specifically yeah. across Israel in places like Jerusalem and Bnei Brak. Why are people failing to adhere to the health ministry's guidelines? Well, first of all, uh, I believe Judaism is, is because it's a very uh, community-based religion, and uh, there's therefore the requirements for a minyan coming together for services, for various uh, life cycle events. There's a big resistance to uh, break that apart because that's somewhat of the glue, the fabric that holds the community together, what defines a uh, religious Jewish community. I think also they often look to their rabbis as their leaders as opposed to the government or the health ministry, although many more and more rabbis are now calling upon their community to, to abide by the health ministry guidelines, and I hope that, that they do, do abide so. Because in New York, as well as in uh, critical uh, Haredi areas in Israel, it's, uh, we see some such a high rate. I, I pray that they will, uh, the rabbis will advise everyone to follow the health ministry guidelines. Uh, so. 
again, similarly, people are still saying that there is no way that they'll miss out on family holiday time with Passover around the corner. How do you feel about this uh, rejection, really, of, of the guidelines? Well, I, I think the rejection of the guidelines or, or really the resistance to the guidelines is across the boards and not just in the ultra Orthodox community. I think sure. everyone's feeling a sense of loss uh, to be able to connect with their families. Uh, we have uh, elderly grandparents who want to have with their grandchildren. We have uh, you know, often the secular who go to the, to the traditional uh, grandparents and they said, what will Passover be without? We're lost. Uh, I think this is something that's hitting all communities, and we're all struggling with this issue to try to figure out solutions of how to uh, enable Passover to be a family holiday as it is every year, and yet um, guard the health of those who are, you know, who are at risk, which is particularly the elderly. So let's actually talk about some of these uh, workarounds, so to speak. Some rabbis have already suggested holding a video conference with, you know, Zoom, Skype, or FaceTime, or, or some other type of video call with family members over the Passover holiday, and this is instead of, of course, endangering people with, with large groupings. What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, you know, it, it was, it's a very fascinating ruling. Uh, it's been put out by some very prominent and respected rabbis. Rabbi Abrajel is the, you know, the president of the Jerusalem uh, religious court. You have the rabbis of, uh, chief rabbis of communities like uh, in Shlomi and Kiryat Gat and Tanya. You even have a rabbi, uh, uh, former rabbi of, uh, uh, chief rabbi of Venice and now the rabbi of Napoli in southern Italy, who came out with a ruling that not only is it permitted, it's required. Um, on the basis that to celebrate the holiday is a biblical command, but the issue of electricity is rabbinic, and in an extreme situation like this is, and a unique, exceptional situation like this is, if there's a necessity to keep the family together, it could even be endangering the life of mm -hmm. the elderly by not being together, the pain and anguish, uh, emotional anguish that that could uh, cause, and also the people who are simply alone. There's so many people, particularly in our community in Tel Aviv, who are singles, who are alone, who have nobody to be with, and Passover is particularly a community holiday. So they've come out with quite a remarkable and, uh, and I think very forth, you know, you know, forth thinking uh, ruling. On the other hand, uh, I haven't seen any Ashkenazi rabbis embrace it. And there are other alternatives. I would even suggest the fact that perhaps this is a chance for the younger generation to step up and to be able to learn how to do a seder themselves because they often rely on the elderly figure, uh, the senior figure of the family, the patriarchal uh, person to run the Seder and then suddenly, you know, at some point uh, they're no longer with us and people are at a loss and this is maybe a chance to learn. We're putting out, for example, a model Seder uh, on our daily Torah Talks Facebook group as part of the Tel Aviv National Synagogue to teach people how to run a Seder and so that they can, on, on, in this exceptional circumstance, learn and gain the skills themselves, which I think could be a very positive thing. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and, and again, have a wonderful holiday and be safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Keep, keep healthy and well. Thank you. Now, is it still possible to travel in and out of Israel? The answer to that question is yes, but it looks like there are only three international airlines that are still operating at Tel Aviv's Ben Gurion Airport. Prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus, 140 airlines served the airport, which is Israel's largest. But now only Aeroflot, United Airlines, and Ethiopian Airlines are continuing operations. Rescue flights to pick up stranded Israelis, on the other hand, will continue to be carried out by the local airline El Al, Arkia, and Isra Air. However, the uh, limited flight services are all part of an effort by the Israeli Airports Authority to cut down on costs. The IAA claims that they've had revenue losses that exceeded 2 billion shekels, which is why 600 workers have been immediately placed on unpaid leave. And there have also been pay reductions and wage cuts for critical staff, and all infrastructure projects have been halted. Israel's Ramon Airport in Eilat uh, in the south will also be operating less hours, although Israel Air flights will continue coming in from Ben Gurion. And these latest measures come after Israel's flagship airline El Al grounded all flights on Thursday until April 4th. Now, last week, the International Air Transport Association estimated a decline of $113 billion in passenger revenues for the worldwide aviation industry by 2020. And they predict that many airlines will run out of cash before recovery arrives. All right, now, it is wine o'clock somewhere, especially nowadays when you're stuck in your home and without much to do. Now, today, we're going to visit some of Israel's top wineries that allow you to order their delicious creations straight to your home. It's time for YVT's Beautiful Faces of Israel segment, produced by the incredible Inon El Natan. Take a look. The land of Israel is also called the land of milk and honey. 
Blessed Earth, among other things, growing vineyards for wine production. Today, we're going to introduce you to three wineries and because of the special situation that we're experiencing in this era of the entire world, we invite you to purchase the wine and the winery owners will send it to you with a special blessing from the Holy Land. Let's start! The first winery grows its 900-foot vineyards on the famous Greece mountain from Bible stories, Toro Winery. Hello everybody, I'm Vered from the Toro Winery in Israel. The winery is located in Rechelim. We came to the mountain of blessing that was empty. After 2,000 years of waiting, we come back to our land and we get, began to settle the land. We began to plant vineyards. And after four years, we saw that we have one of the best grapes in Israel. Like the prophet of Jeremiah, he said, The meaning is, one day you should come back to your land and plant vineyards and produce wine again. Two winery is a family business. As my husband, he is the winemaker, he is the best. I am the manager of sales and marketing. Together we do a very good job. We have more than 70 awards, international awards from all over the world, that all of them says the wine of Samaria, of the biblical land, is one of the best wines in the world today. Tour Winery also produces fine olive oil, free shipping with the order of a box of 12 bottles of wine. The next winery sits close to the City of the Fathers, La Forêt Blanche Winery. My name is Yaakov Briss. We're currently in La Forêt Blanche Winery, located in Moshav Yatir. The name La Forêt Blanche is taken from a translation of one of the names of the temple, which was called Ya'ar Alevanon. Our vineyard is called after Caleb and Yefune, Stay Kalev. This is where we grow our grapes for these wines. It's located right near Marat Machpela, near Hebron, where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. And this is exactly the place where 3,500 years ago, people took the grapes to make wine and bring it to the temple. This is our deepest connection to the land and to the temple. That, that is the name of La Forêt Blanche. Hi. The last winery today is a five-stone winery located right on David and Goliath's battlefield. Hi, my name is Ilan Hasson. I'm the founder of Five Stones Vineyard. Our vineyards are located in Givati Shayahu in the Ella Valley, the same place where David beat Goliath, and in this historical place, we decided to plant our vineyards. All our grapes are coming from this area and we produce usually only blend wines in three levels of uh, different labels. The DVSG, the nobility and the virtuous. We are very proud that our wines of the very young winery that started production only five years ago already got very nice scores from the well-known wine critics from all over the world. I'm suddenly very thirsty. At least it's nice to be able to travel to these wineries with our eyes since we can't do any traveling uh, with our feet lately. Now for those of you who want to check out more videos like this about the Holy Land, go to www.tbf-news.com and download the app Why Travel. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. It's a steamy 28 degrees Celsius outside or 84 Fahrenheit with fully sunny skies. Take advantage of the warm weather from your balcony though because the temperature is expected to drop tomorrow to 19 degrees Celsius or 66 Fahrenheit with rain throughout the day. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel on tubing. is how you get tested for coronavirus. <laughs> Amazing. It's glad to see. I'm glad, I'm glad at least, uh, you know, some medical workers are having a lot of fun with this. Now, all right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.56 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Forrest. Thank you so much for watching.